I live inside one of those picture-perfect, gated neighborhoods. A place where life is always safe and sound because nobody can come in and disturb the peace that is so naturally dear to the residents' hearts. Not with all these security in place. Cameras on each corner watching every step. Neighbors that are extra attentive. And then we have this cold and ugly concrete building at the entrance where these security people work. It's probably the only hideous piece of architecture in here. It has one of the guards standing right at the gate and greeting everyone who passes by with a friendly wave and smile. That is, if they truly belong here, of course. The loud and busy town isn't far away, but if you stood behind the gate, you wouldn't be able to tell as we are half surrounded by deep forest. My new neighborhood, named as Sanctuary Hills despite not sitting on a hill, is the essence of Sararia. Two level homes, often in hunter green or eggshell white, embellish the wide streets with long driveways. The homes are big enough for generations, but usually only inhabited by a married couple with one child and a dog. When a family is very extraordinary, they might have a cat instead, but that's the tip of craziness the people here might express. The people that live here are the kind that cut the grass on their lawns on the same day every week. Each building here has a spacious pool. Many shaped just like kidneys, but most are hardly used. Except for when there's a pool party, of course, and there are many. Usually in combination with a barbecue. In the short time that I've lived here, I must have been invited to three already, but I didn't make it to one. They usually start very early in the day when I still work. While I never imagined this to be my cup of tea, I am still astonished by the way that I enjoy these surroundings that are so perfect. It should be uncanny, but somehow it's not. Somehow you do always feel safe. It really is a nice neighborhood, even if I don't entirely fit the demographic. I only came here very recently after my grandmother had started getting more unwell. She has been living here on her own since grandpa passed, and as I work remote, it seemed perfectly reasonable for me to come and live with her. She doesn't need anybody to take care of her physically, just company that is around and ready if her head starts to spin. And besides, grandma is as sweet as grandmothers get. So being here for her is more than simple for me, and I get to live in a beautiful home in a wonderful place. The only negative side to all of this is the lack of people my age. Most residents are either rather old and have been living here for centuries, or they're middle-aged with children, seldom plural and in many cases singular. To repeat myself, neither really fits my demographic, but for now, this is totally fine especially considering social interactions are currently limited either way. It's one of the reasons, or possibly the main one, why I didn't mind when I was told about the curfew. I've heard of many places and towns that believe a curfew could be beneficial to our current situation. And while here inside Sanctuary Hills, there are many places that I would go anyway, especially not at night. The curfew begins right after dinner time, which currently is 8 p.m., just after sunset. It was one of the first things that Grandma told me when I arrived in something that she still repeats often. Make sure to be back inside before curfew. People really do not appreciate it if you don't. They're a sucker for the rules. She said with a smile that didn't match the sentiment in her voice. Sure, that's fine. It's not forever, right? I laughed. Oh, of course not. The sun moves with the days. Soon you'll have more time. What? As I said, physically, Grandma was feeling fine. Mentally, however, her mind was not as sharp as it used to be. Can you go to the store, hon? What time is it now? She asked now with a much calmer expression. It was only 2 p.m. when I made my way to the store and less than half an hour later, I was standing in line waiting for my turn. The store is rather a small shop but has everything that we need. 
If we wanted to splurge, I suppose we could go to the markets in town, but Grandma likes the products here and is very used to them. And Grandpa used to enjoy them as well, and honestly, I like them too. The produce is fresh, and while the brands are unfamiliar, everything tastes nice. So I was standing in line when I saw the only person so far that truly grabbed my attention in a very different way than the other people here. If I notice the people in Sanctuary Hills, it's usually because they seem so peculiar with their looks and their tastes. With hair too high and makeup too bright, as if they recently escaped out of a book by Dr. Seuss. The person that I saw standing just in front of the grocery store, however, was a young man around my age, and dressed in a denim jacket with black pants. He was holding a cigarette but not even taking a drag. Instead, he seemed to focus on something in the air or possibly on the lamppost. I could have just walked out and talked to him, but I used to live in the big city where you usually don't talk to neighbors at all, and somehow I felt too shy. So I found an excuse by buying a pack of cigarettes at the counter, despite not having smoked in years and asking the stranger for a lighter as I walked outside, with my paper bag filled with groceries. I suppose I really was a bit desperate for friends in this lonely place. You're new here, aren't you? He asked after lighting up my cigarette. I suppressed the urge to cough and answered, Yeah, I'm staying with my grandma for a while. He inspected me a second too long and then said, uh, Abigail Allen. Yeah, that's her. How'd you know? The neighborhood wasn't big and if he lived here for a while, it wouldn't surprise me if he knew most of the people but guessing simply from my appearance alone was a bit too fast. He grinned. I'm not a stalker, I promise. I know all the people that live here and hear about any new comings right away. Well, that's not strange at all. He laughed. I have a good reason, I swear. I'm in charge of these security systems here and usually install the cameras for the people's homes as well. He pointed toward the thing that he earlier was looking at. It was a security camera hanging on top of the lamppost. You know, it's all kind of ironic. I usually feel far more unsafe when there's too much security. Like there has to be a reason they're so careful, right? I said and already started regretting my words, but the guy smiled again. And to be honest, I don't see the purpose either. But I get paid so I won't complain. Uh, so let's hope the people here stay paranoid. I laughed. We chatted a bit longer, longer than I initially imagined we would, but I assumed the stranger, his name was Jack as I found out, didn't have much interaction with peers in Sanctuary Hills either. He did know people in town, however, and invited me to go for a beer by the river with them, just after dinner. What about the curfew? I raised an eyebrow. Jack gave me a funny look as if I was a bit clueless. How old are you? Now he was raising an eyebrow. I rolled my eyes. Funny, I'm 25 but you know what curfew I mean. They blast it through the speakers every evening. Jack chuckled. Alright, I see. And you live with your grandma too who probably doesn't go out at night either way but trust me, you can. I think it's more so the kids stay inside. Nobody's gonna arrest you for leaving the house after 8, Charlie. So far, I never really had a reason to go outside, but thinking about it, Sanctuary Hills had such a small population, and going to a different place for one evening seemed perfectly reasonable. Depending on how long I would stay here, finding some friends would be nice. Besides, Jack worked for the security system or whatever. If it was that forbidden, he would know. Alright, I'm in, I decided. Hey, cool. So, shall we meet at the gate? Just after 8. Grandma and I had dinner, but she was rather tired and went to bed early. I hadn't told her about my plans to go out, but I figured that I would leave her a note. And I would take my phone with me so that she could reach me if she needed to. 
I noticed that I was a bit late when I suddenly heard the announcements from the street. I had heard them the past days too, of course, but somehow they seemed even louder now. Attention, attention, residents of Sanctuary Hills. Please be aware that the curfew begins in only five minutes. Find your way home swiftly and have a pleasant sanctuary evening inside your homes. The announcement started and ended with a jingle. I must say I felt a bit nervous going outside after hearing the announcement. I had been a lot more confident when I was talking to Jack. Suddenly, I also felt guilty for wanting to leave without Grandma knowing. I sighed and made the choice not to go out. However, I didn't have Jack's number and simply not showing up would be really rude. So I decided that I would quickly run down to the gate, tell him to leave without me and come back home. A few minutes outside past curfew really shouldn't be an issue after all. Well, that's the point when I learned oh, how seriously the curfew really is taken by the people of Sanctuary Hills. I learned the hard way when I opened the door to my home only a few minutes before 8. As I opened the wooden door, I was greeted by two bright faces grinning so intensely, it almost appeared as if they were in pain. A man and a woman that I hadn't seen before. She had red hair with much volume and was wearing round pink glasses. Her lips were bright red and her flowery dress seemed not casual at all. He completed her look with a button-down shirt, perfectly ironed brown pants and shiny loafers. They looked strangely old-fashioned, even more than the other people here. Well, hello there. What a sweet darling you are. Don't you agree, Harold? The woman said and the makeup on her face started cracking from her non-stopping smile. Oh, pleasantly, darling, truly, my dear. I laughed politely but mainly nervously. Good evening. Are you looking for my grandma? I asked. Oh, no, dear, we're not. Abigail is a sweetheart and is often in bed before the time. She doesn't worry us one bit. The woman spoke. Worry? Why would? We hope you did not intend to leave the house. That would be an awful mistake. Haven't you looked at the time? Oh, it must have slipped your mind. Well, now, now, swiftly go back in and we will forgive and forget. They both laughed. And all, all of a sudden, they were sounding nervous. I'm sorry, have we met before? I asked and my eyes moved to the clock above our door. I never thought about it before, but it was a strange place to hang a clock. They didn't answer my question. The man now had his hand in the door frame, too close for my taste. I'm only planning to bring a message to a friend. I'll be right back home, I said, feeling weird that I had to make excuses for doing something so normal. No reasonable friend would meet you at a time like that, my dear. Now, will you listen or not? They were still smiling, but their voices were raised so high that I was afraid they would wake my grandma. Right, I'm sorry. Where do you live? I asked. They turned their heads in a half circle and pointed towards the scarlet red house on the other side of the street. I had been wondering who lived in a house so noticeable. Their heads moved back so quickly that their necks had no chance to follow. For a second, I thought that they might break. My feet moved back faster than I could think. My gut started screaming to shut the door. Those creatures that called themselves neighbors were far too uncanny. Something was utterly wrong with them. It made my blood almost freeze. How did you? I muttered and then swallowed. I promise I won't go outside. Liar, the woman shouted. At that point, I was more than worried. These people were scaring me, and the slowly setting sun was only adding to the gloomy atmosphere. I shut the door without another thought. My hands started shaking and I didn't understand why. I didn't understand how I was suddenly so scared by such a situation that should be ordinary from an outsider's perspective. I wanted to go and talk to the only person that I had met, and somehow trusted. 
but I couldn't possibly leave Grandma. Should I call the police? I wondered, but I changed my mind as those weirdos hadn't actually done anything. I stood in front of the closed door, but I could still hear them. They didn't leave. I heard them breathing, louder and louder by the second. I had to go wake Grandma. That was my second thought, but it was interrupted. A shiver went through my body when I felt a sharp pain in my left arm. What are you doing? I turned my head and my eyes met the ones of Abigail. My grandmother stared at me with pupils so big that I thought her eyes were all black. Her nails were digging into my skin. When she saw my scared expression, she let go. I'm sorry, honey. I told you to not go out after dark. They don't like it. They don't like it one bit. I thought my grandmother's mind was a bit confused, but after seeing those neighbors, she appeared like the sharp one. Come look. She waved me to the window. My stomach made a turn when I saw Harold and his strange wife standing on our lawn waving. There appeared to be other people behind them too, but I couldn't look at them for long. Grandmother waved back and that seemed to make them happy, but not happy enough to leave. Oh no, they stayed. They stayed for hours despite the curfew that they were now breaking themselves. Or maybe it didn't count because they were standing on a lawn. That's when Grandma pulled me away from the window and closed the blinds. They shielded us from views outside, but not from the noise. The noise of ear-splitting screams, painful and sharp. I couldn't exactly tell if they were near or simply so loud that you could hear them throughout the entire neighborhood. My first thought was that it had to be Jack somewhere outside, but I couldn't say for sure. What had I gotten myself into? All I knew was that there was no way that I could go outside. I was stuck in here, at least in safety for now. You woke them up and now they'll stay for a bit. Grandma interrupted my thoughts as she gently stroked my hair. But it's all good, love. Just stay inside with me until the morning, yes? Now, I know that my reaction might have been just as odd or at least nearly as strange as the one of the neighbors. I obliged to the curfew and stayed inside despite knowing that something was not right. But then again, what else was I supposed to do? They stood there all night, even when it started raining and hailing. I couldn't help but wonder if they were somehow helping me keeping me away from what would cause the torture outside. However, one look at their stiff faces that had smiles plastered on them assured me that they couldn't possibly have good neighborly duties in mind. And wondering whether it was only them, Harold and her who had an issue or two, proved wrong as well when it slowly became a crowd of people out there on her lawn. Grandma acted like it was the most normal thing and was sure at least one of us was going insane. Or possibly both of us went a bit loony in our own ways. Inside this home and this neighborhood that we weren't leaving. Sanctuary Hills had its hands wrapped around us tightly and we stayed. Well, Grandma did because she had been living here for ages and saw no reason to leave now. I will elaborate on her far too apathetic reaction to the insane neighbors later. I must have been even crazier for not leaving either, but I believed to have good reasons. 1. I didn't have a car and my only form of transportation was my feet, and walking or even running from those weirdos did not seem like a great plan. 2nd. I couldn't possibly leave my grandmother and as previously mentioned, she certainly was not going. I did try to call for help as one should in a terrifying situation as such. It seemed logical to me and under normal circumstances it sure would have been. The first one that I tried to reach was my mother. My mother who is the personification of concern and who I normally would choose last to share my fears with simply because she is so terribly anxious. 
And no, she didn't try to talk sense into me or prove to me that everything was fine and well. No, she acted awfully worse. Our call went just the same way as it did with anybody else that I tried to reach. Mom, I don't know what to do. I think that we might be in danger. Grandma is not. Oh, darling, say hi to your grandmother for me. I haven't called her in ages. I'm an awful daughter, aren't I? Mom, no, you need to listen. Something is terribly wrong. Are you making sure that she's eating well? I know how she adores sweets, but... What is going on? I shrieked. Mom, I can't get a hold of the police. I don't know what to do. Right. Oh, honey, I almost forgot. Make sure your grandpa takes his medicine. After those words, I hung up. My mother couldn't have possibly forgotten that her own father had died more than a year ago. My hands were shaking. No, my entire body was trembling. At first, I believed that only the people in Sanctuary Hills were going insane or had been insane all the time without me consciously noticing, but now it was spreading. Believing that maybe, just maybe, it was only my family. I called others too. All sorts of numbers that I had on my phone. Friends, old colleagues, and even an ex. Every conversation went like me talking about one thing, and then responding to questions that I had never asked. For the rest of the night, I locked myself and grandma inside her room. She went to sleep and I went crazy until morning came. After numbing down from the shock just enough, my mind started calculating and racing through every logical explanation, as well as illogical ones including their prospective outcomes. Like a machine, my head went through the algorithms. No result was satisfactory, however. Everything was nice and normal and fine. And that's when Grandma assured me what was happening. I still wasn't sure what to do next. Our lawn was empty, but I did see people walking around outside as they do each day. A postman walking around, filling me peculiar mailboxes, gardeners watering plants, and children playing hopscotch. They all appeared so awfully regular that I almost decided to open the door and talk to someone, but somehow I couldn't bring myself to turn the doorknob. I was too anxious. The curfew wouldn't start for another many hours, but I didn't dare to leave the house. It proved safe last night at least. More hours passed and I eventually fell asleep from all the exhaustion and from staying up all night. It must to have been late in the afternoon when I woke up again. When there was a knock on the door later in the evening, my heart skipped a beat. I started cold sweating, only thinking about those neighbors standing outside again. They had left some time in the early morning. I saw when I had quickly peeked through the curtains. I tiptoed towards the door and looked through the spy. It was Jack. I stood behind the door, suddenly too scared to even move. I wasn't sure if I could trust this stranger. No, I felt like I couldn't trust him one bit because if he was as normal as he had appeared yesterday, then he wouldn't be here. Because if he was outside during curfew, then he wasn't safe out there, and he couldn't stand here normal and fine. I was genuinely sure that those screams came from him. Now I was wondering if he was the one causing him. Mrs. Allen, Charlie, hello. I heard him say through the door and then he knocked three times but I still didn't move. I prayed that he would leave so that I could just plan my next steps. It felt ludicrous being this anxious when the street seemed normal just as it did the past days that I was here. But it wasn't. After last night, nothing felt normal anymore even if the appearance tried to make me believe that it was. I slowly took a step back, fearing that he might hear me breathe, but that was a big mistake because before I could help it, Grandma had appeared and opened the door. It all happened so quickly I didn't even realize that she was standing here. I thought that she was in bed. Good afternoon, dear, she politely said. Good afternoon. He responded and his eyes quickly shifted to me. Are you okay? 
he carefully asked. I stayed silent. Oh, I didn't know that you were acquainted. How wonderful that you're making some friends, Charlie. Oh, come on in, dear. Let's make some tea. Grandma opened the door wide and then walked towards the kitchen and even had the audacity to wink at me. I couldn't believe her. Did she purposely forget the nightmare that we went through? I was ready to just slam the door shut, but Jack had already made his way inside. It's strange how all the houses look exactly the same on the inside. He laughed, and when his eyes met mine again, he suddenly looked a bit more concerned. Are you ill? I was wondering why you didn't show up. Imagine that you had changed your mind or something. I breathed in deeply. I couldn't. The curfew. I said, making sure to closely watch how he would respond. He raised an eyebrow. So you decided to be a law-abiding citizen after all. I clenched my fist. I surely didn't feel like playing this game after the night that I had. Why are you here? I hissed and he seemed a bit taken aback by my sudden anger. Oh, well, well, I was a bit worried when you didn't show up yesterday, but... He paused for a moment. I didn't want to appear to a stalkery, you know. We don't really even know each other after all. So? So, I'm here to check on your grandmother's cameras outside and casually trying to find out if you stood me up on purpose. He nervously laughed. Somehow in this moment, he really did seem genuine. I wanted to believe that this was all normal, but how on earth could he be so oblivious to the situation? Didn't you hear the screaming last night? I asked. He looked confused. Screaming? Yeah, and if you were outside, did nobody try to stop you? Because they certainly made sure that I would stay inside. I raised my voice again. They. The neighbors. The ones from the Scarlet Red House and all their psychotic friends. Oh, he laughed. I see you met Trudy and Harold. I suppose they are a tad eccentric. Eccentric? They didn't leave me all night. Now he was raising an eyebrow again and that reaction was really getting on my nerves. Charlie, is everything okay? He said in a worried tone. Oh, she had a fever last night. My grandmother who appeared behind us with a tray spoke. She mumbled all sorts of nonsense all night. Nightmares, I suppose. Now what happened? They were out there, they... Now both my grandma and Jack had that worried look on their faces. I'm sure something happened, but maybe your mind played some tricks on you, Jack said. Well, why don't you just show her whatever the camera on my lawn did film the night before? Possibly that will calm the poor child down. Cameras. It was the first helpful thing that my grandmother said. Looking at the security cameras must have been the most terrifying experience so far. Not because of what we saw, but because of what we didn't. A couple appeared in the frame, Harold and Trudy. They were dressed, and just as I remembered from what I could make out on the screen. However, Trudy was holding something in her hand. A basket of some sort. I didn't remember her carrying anything yesterday, but then again... I was slightly distracted by her face, which seemed to be cracking up. From the view, I could exactly see myself when the door opened. I'm trying to emphasize that it was my face that I saw. Until that point, it all made sense and I felt a shiver only thinking about what would happen next. Except it didn't. Trudy handed me the basket, I smiled, we chatted some more as it seemed and they turned around and laughed. Soon they were out of the picture and clearly not on our lawn with other neighbors gathering. No, there was nobody, even when we fast forwarded the tape. I sat there in shock. It's not possible, I whispered. Oh, well, darling, you simply cannot and often should not trust your mind. It's trickery. Jack laughed at what she said but collected himself quickly. I'm sorry, Charlie. I'm sure it felt very vivid. That can happen with fever dreams. But it's not possible. I muttered and then with more confidence, I exclaimed. 
the basket. She never gave me a freaking basket. Oh, honey. Grandma said as she pointed towards the stool next to the bathroom, where of course sat a wooden basket filled with biscuits and a bottle of wine. They really are awfully attentive neighbors, aren't they? Jack gave me a sympathetic smile. Until this point, I thought something was wrong with him. Now he must have been sure that I was the lunatic. And Grandma had just gone to the kitchen as we all forgot that it was dinner time. I, for one, had forgotten all other meals as well, and so she jumped up quickly to scramble something up for me that would hopefully unscramble my mind. If you would like, we could watch some other tapes too, if that would ease your mind. I mean, I'm technically not allowed to, but you seem really worried, Jack said to me. I really didn't trust what I saw on the tape, basket or not. I was sure that Trudy had doctored it in one way or the other. My mind was hazy and slow at that point. I couldn't think for myself anymore. All I wanted was a bit of truth. I suppose that's why I didn't consciously notice the announcement. It almost sounded like some sort of background noise that my mind was blocking out. Attention, attention residents of Sanctuary Hills. Please be aware that the curfew begins in only five minutes. Find your way home swiftly and have a pleasant sanctuary evening inside your homes. But even as tired as I was, it didn't make sense to me how my legs started moving and following this boy to the threshold of the door. And I swear there was a sparkle in his eye when he took my hand and guided me through it. Only the sudden movement and the feeling of pain brought me back to the moment. Grandma had grabbed my arm in a sudden and seldom moment of clarity and pulled me back inside just in time. I didn't believe her weak arms were capable of it, but it was so hard I thought my arm might dislocate. You will not have my granddaughter killed just so she stays out there with you forever and ever. She is here to visit and will leave when the time is right and she will abide by the rules just as I have for the past years. Do you hear me? Grandma was shouting louder than ever before. Jack seemingly unimpressed just grinned and turned around. We'll see about that, Abigail. We both know she won't be able to cross that threshold. And with that, he slammed the door shut, but he didn't leave. He stayed right outside. I knew that soon Trudy and Harold and the others would join, but I didn't expect to see their faces glued to our window when I opened the curtain. I jumped back, ignoring the group of neighbors that had gathered. Two groups. The ones that looked old-fashioned and were smiling, just like Trudy and Harold, and the ones that appeared bloodthirsty just like Jack. Grandma, what the heck? I shouted. She looked genuinely shocked by my sudden outburst. She wasn't used to me getting loud with her. Charlie, she mumbled. I clenched my fists. I was so incredibly angry. Although suddenly it made sense that my grandmother never came to visit us. She always had an excuse, like back when Grandpa was alive that he was feeling too sick or that she had too much in her mind to travel. After a while, Sanctuary Hills traps you in. Why didn't you warn me? Why didn't you tell me to stay away? I collected myself enough to lower my voice, but it surprised me how evil it still sounded. Grandma looked to the ground. She was mumbling something that I couldn't understand. I told you at first not to come, but you insisted. And then the thought was nested into my mind. I couldn't decline. Strangely, this was the first thing she said that actually made sense to me, as I had been corrupted by their doings as well. They have a way to play with your mind, only a bit, but not too much. Not enough to change you entirely. Only so much that you won't doubt. You can control it a bit, at least I can. I stop when their manipulative worms dig in too deep. However, Grandma's mind is not as strong anymore. Not only due to her age, being here and living here it gradually changes your interpretation of the surroundings. The longer you stay, the more you interact with the people, the more you become a part of Sanctuary Hills. 
I've come here before to visit and I left without a scratch, though I did always leave before dark. Grandfather used to insist that the roads get too dangerous at night. They never let me stay past dinner and now it made sense why. I've been corrupted by Jack and Harold and Trudy in the streets, by the peculiar food that we buy and consume, by swimming in the pool. Sanctuary Hills is protecting me, but not for my own benefit. It creates its perfect residence, bit by bit. If we don't oblige to the rules, it simply will swallow you as that is the only solution. Jack was helping. Not me, but the neighborhood. Maybe you can leave, but I never will. You see, my love, I don't even want to. Sanctuary Hills has all that I need. I could never go, it would rip my heart out. My grandmother said after a long silence. I didn't understand what exactly she meant by that, but then I looked outside despite not wanting to see the faces of those neighbors ever again, and I saw someone new waving at me. Somebody was standing there and waving and smiling, and while I should have been even more terrified by that figure than by anyone else so far, I somehow felt safe. I somehow felt like I belonged just a tiny bit more. He was dressed very well. His hair was combed and thick and his smile felt truly genuine. Maybe because he hadn't been a part of them for long. And that's when I understood why Grandma felt so safe despite all of this happening here. And why she felt comfortable in Sanctuary Hills. A tear rolled down my face when I saw the man standing close to the uncanny neighbors because he was not like them and I whispered more to myself than to my grandmother who smiled at just as warm as he did. Sanctuary Hills had taken over my mind as it does with anyone that stays too long to only be a guest. We all are swallowed by the need for the neighborhood to be perfect and right. There is not one person not a community or a committee deciding on the rules. No, uh, they are part of the grounds and the air and the water in this particular place. I haven't quite understood why and when this all started, but I do know that anyone that lives inside the gates does whatever they can to feed it, to make sure that everything here stays the way that it has been. Some do by choice, for others the choice is made. I suppose for the people here, Sanctuary Hills is not a place. It's a religion. They all believe in it, but they have different interpretations about how to do right by their belief. Naturally, they have different approaches to feed the sanctuary. There are the ones that religiously make sure that the number one rule of the curfew is being obeyed, though that is not the only item that they take care of. There are more customs that, to this point, I hadn't met, but soon would. And then there are the ones that are trapped, that know of the rules, that possibly broke them and now would not be able to go either way, and so they tricked anyone new that seems to be an easy target. I don't believe their intentions are inherently evil. No, they are simply bored. And boredom can, despite its connotation, be a very dangerous emotion. Harold and Trudy were roll sticklers. Jack was bored. Of course, in this scenario, we have the added factor of Sanctuary Hills scrambling minds. Sometimes a little and often a lot, and therefore it is difficult to say what and who was right without having a neutral or even believable source. Although I did find one person who, as I had mentioned before, should have been scaring me because they were dead. However, I suppose at this point, I hadn't realized that more residents inside these gates were long gone, but their spirits were still going strong. Which takes me back to when I saw him out there on our lawn. My grandpa who used to write me letters and put candies inside the envelope and who would encourage me to do what I needed with my life whenever my parents gave me another hard time, and who I felt so incredibly guilty about for not visiting more, 
especially when I heard the news that he was now gone. Maybe the guilt is the reason that brought me here. Maybe that's why I didn't think during that particular moment either. Why I didn't use my manipulated mind. No, I mean my conscious one, of course. Was that my own mind making a blanker? Was it Sanctuary Hills? I actually believe it was the first. Well, I did something stupid, I can't deny that. It was just after 9 or 10 maybe. The exact time doesn't matter, but it definitely was dark out and that's what should have stopped me. The sun had disappeared just before the creature had appeared on our lawn. And I opened the door. Charlie! His voice sounded different. Or maybe I didn't remember well because the last time that I had heard him, it was only over the phone. I thought that he looked odd. Well, of course he looked odd. He was dead after all, but that's not what he looked like. He was different because of his face. His clothes were the same, well familiar at least. A checkered shirt and brown pants. And colorful dispensers as you don't see them on people often anymore. He waved and another tear rolled down my face. My vision was focused only on him and I forgot anyone else around. All the terrifying creatures that I couldn't call a human anymore were gathered out there while trying to lure me out or force me to stay inside. Listen to your heart. That's what they say. My heart was telling me to run to my grandpa and ask him to make everything okay. I took a step. One step and I swore it was tiny but technically, I was outside when I wasn't supposed to. Grandpa smiled and I saw Jack move closer and he seemed kind too. That's what should have stopped me, but they didn't. Someone else did. It was Trudy. She had come far too close again. I hadn't noticed because I was distracted by the look of my deceased grandfather on the lawn. But now she was so close to my face that I could feel a cold breath coming from her mouth or maybe from the air. Her eyes were opened wide and while she didn't stop smiling, her face appeared furious. Furious enough to crack even more and almost splinter into a thousand pieces. You are in awfully lot of trouble, young lady, and you better change that sooner than later. She whispered in a high-pitched voice, and then she pushed me with unbelievable strength. The door slammed shut. Trudy was gone, but Harold glued his face back to our window. When I fell back and the door was closed, I suddenly felt a sharp pain. Not from my elbows, which I fell on. They hurt a bit, but not as much as my ankle. When I pulled up my pants, just enough to see what was hurting, I saw the bloody imprint of a hand. I hadn't felt a thing when I was out there. Go away! I cried and shouted towards Harold as I slammed my fist against the window in his distorted face. I didn't want to see him again. I wanted to see my grandfather. Listen to your heart, they say. However, it doesn't really make sense because... Your emotions are not in your heart. They're in your brain as well. It's all just a trick. I suppose in those tiny moments in which I had a clear thought, there weren't many as my surroundings did their best to scramble them. I felt punches in my gut. The ones that told me, not now. I felt my grandma's breath on my neck and knew that she was thinking of going out there herself, even after seeing my ankle. Maybe, she whispered. They are all out there after all. How dangerous can it be? I understood her logic. It seemed perfectly understandable because it wasn't intrusive. The intrusive thought was the one telling us to stay inside. We simply weren't quite sure which one to listen to as neither seemed to be our own. One voice came from the inside. It was the sanctuary telling us to stick to what we ought to. 
But then, there were the outside voices mocking our fear and telling us to come play. He wouldn't do that to us though, would he? No, certainly not. He was a kind man with a warm heart that now has turned cold. He would protect us, cold or not, Grandma said. I suppose deep inside she knew the truth. She knew, but she didn't mind a little lie as long as she could still see him from time to time. It was what made Sanctuary Hills her place, even if it was fake. Even if that man out there wasn't Grandpa, and not his ghost either. The man out there, in fact, wasn't a man. Like the basket and the pictures from the cameras, he wasn't right. He wasn't there. They wanted to lure us out to our demise. All right, Grandma, what do we do? Oh, honey, there is only one answer to this question at this particular time of night. We keep our doors shut and go to bed. Tiny twitches and micro expressions showed me that she was still inside that shell. That sanctuary hadn't consumed her entirely. In the morning, I spent another hour or two making phone calls, but hearing the voices of my loved ones saying only nonsense and wrong things tore me apart even more. The only thing they listened to and responded to normally was the question of whether they should come visit. And I always said no. Not until I knew what fate they might meet inside the gates if the neighbors found out. I could already picture Jack licking his lips on the prospect of fresh blood and corruptible minds. All right, hon, I'm off to the market. Do you need anything? Grandma called out from the hallway. For a split second, I wondered if everything was normal and I was the weird one. She said it so casually as if the past nights and days didn't happen. I jumped out of bed and ran towards the door where Grandma was putting on her coat. You are what? I shrieked. Sweetie, are you alright? Do you want me to pick up some medicine or possibly some fresh ginger and lemon? That always makes me feel just great. You're going outside? Why yes, it's the middle of the day, you silly goose. Why wouldn't, and by the pale look in your skin, I would suggest you get some of those rays of sun on it yourself. My gaze shifted towards the window when I saw the lawn, all green and pretty. The sun was shining. It was a beautiful day. Perfect weather for the pool. Grandma smiled and then she left before I could stop her. Everything was normal. It always was normal when it was day. Not entirely normal as it is in other places, but normal enough for sanctuary hills. The postman was filling peculiar mailboxes. Children were playing hopscotch. Garbage was being collected. I decided to get dressed and go to the market as well. One, because I didn't like the thought of grandma alone. And two, because on my way, I could also check the gate with the security guard out front to see what an escape might look like and if I would even need one in the middle of the day before the curfew begins. Maybe I could somehow go and get help or make a plan to free Grandma before my mind is taken over by the neighborhood. And Grandma was long gone, so I had to get dressed quickly and hurry to meet her there before she went someplace else. She didn't even ask if I wanted to come along. On my way out of the door, I found a card. I had received a few ones like this before, but unusually, I just pinned them to the fridge to forget about them. It was another invitation. Dearest neighbors Abigail and Charlotte, what a pleasant weekend for a lovely midday barbecue in our greenest garden. Yes, you are thinking right. We would like to invite you to another party tomorrow at 2 p.m. sharp. We know that it's very last minute, but we do like to be spontaneous. Make sure to be on time because, as you know, time is scarce. You may bring your swimsuit, but that's up to you. Besides bringing good fun, a dish of your choice would be swell. See you tomorrow. Certainly not possibly. Trisha, Tony, and Trina. I stuffed the card in my pocket and made my way to the market. 
The letter distracted me enough so that I left the doorstep without hesitation. I had been afraid of the thought before, but now I was outside and it seemed all right. I ran all the way to the market and on my way, I could swear that I saw Jack sitting on a porch, winking at me and grinning, but I ignored him and ran even faster until I made it to the marketplace. I had never seen the market before. It was like a farmer's market with fresh produce being sold as well as little whimsical products. From further away it looked really nice and inviting but that was just from the outside. As soon as I stepped inside the marketplace everything appeared just a little wrong, as it does in Sanctuary Hills, and the longer that I stayed the more the little wrong turned into horribly frightening. I recognized a few faces from around the neighborhood, but nobody who I had ever talked to. I've never exactly been the kind of person to talk to neighbors much and after this experience, I don't think I ever will be. I kept my eyes open for grandma but couldn't spot her anywhere so I decided to stroll through the narrow passages. From far away it appeared as if there was a dozen stalls and tops. Now that I had actually walked inside the first passage, it changed entirely. Everything did. There were many people, goods, stalls, and games. Almost like a beautiful oriental market with lots of colors and products, but it couldn't in any way be possible. I had just entered a labyrinth with fragrances and images too sharp to be real. In all its wrongness, however, it was perfectly right. A perfect market would suit a perfect neighborhood. And if the space wasn't big enough, then that, that fact would simply be changed. Perfectly reasonable for these sanctuary logic. I walked towards the stall with the most delicious scent that I had ever smelled in my life. It reminded me of the days in the kitchen with my mother when we would bake and cook all day before Christmas. Only as I got closer, I realized what it was that smelled so dangerously delicious. It was coming from a booth where a man sold jars filled with something that I couldn't recognize from far away. I only followed my nose and not my eyes, but I should have focused on the latter. I truly should have, but I didn't because my mind was on the sanctuary autopilot again. Standing in front of the booth, I didn't look at the man but only at his products. I didn't know what was inside of these jars. Cinnamon, I whispered. It was the smell of cinnamon except even sweeter and more intense. Mm, delicious, isn't it? The sweet smell of death. I looked up towards the man who was dressed in a suit which didn't fit the market one bit. Excuse me? I asked. Mm, the smell. We collect our items from a very special place you see, he winked. A special place, a different place. Have you left Sanctuary Hills and if you did, can you tell me how? I spoke without taking a breath. He didn't answer that question. Instead, he said, Open a jar and your eyes will see what's inside, doll. I hesitated for a second but then opened the jar. Even though it was made out of glass, I didn't see what was inside from the outside, but... When the lid opened, I dropped the jar right to the floor. It was filled with eyes. Human eyes stuffed inside to the top. You dropped it, how silly of you. I, what? I muttered. Oh, it's okay, you can pay me back. He said with his eyes wide open. Come back tonight and you can pay. He reached for my arm, but I pulled away just in time and tried running away. I stumbled into too many people, some apologized as if it was their fault and others whispered as they saw me but I couldn't look at them. I had to get out, I just didn't know which way to go. I swallowed and kept going until I finally saw her. Grandma! I cried and hugged her from behind. She stood in front of a stall selling jewelry. Charlie, oh honey, how distressed you look. Are you alright, my sweet child? Oh, she does look awfully distressed, but so very pretty. Is she your daughter? The girl behind the table asked. She was young, possibly my age, but her clothes looked more like the ones of a housewife from the 1950s. Her caramel hair was curled up perfectly, 
and her cheeks and lips were rose red. Grandma giggled. Oh, Darla, you make me blush. Now this is my granddaughter. I've wanted to introduce you. Either way, she's so lonely here being young and new. New? A new voice said, a male voice. He had appeared from the side. I hadn't noticed him before. He had the same color hair as Darla, but his clothes were far more normal. Grandma, please, let's go home, I whispered. I wasn't ready for meeting new crazy people. Oh, Daniel, don't be rude and introduce yourself first. And also, I tell you all the time, use entire sentences. Now, she was looking at Grandma and shook her head. I tell him all the time. She turned her head towards me and held out her hand. I'm Darla and this is my twin brother, Daniel. I didn't shake her hand. Are you going to ask me to come outside after curfew? I asked. Never. Darla called out, seemingly shocked. Good neighbors obey the curfew. She said in unison with my grandma. I took a step back. I'm sorry, love. I should take Charlie home. She hasn't been feeling too well these past few days, you see. Will we see you tomorrow? Darla asked with big eyes. I always hope for friends my age at the garden parties, you see. She smiled and her eye twitched a little. Yes, please come, you must. Her brother, who had been silent so far, added. He didn't smile and he didn't twitch, but he put much emphasis on the last word. He seemed the most normal, but so would Jack. I didn't trust the neighbors one bit. I couldn't care less about some barbecue. I wanted to take Grandma home and hide inside before these speakers started blasting the curfew call. The whole day had passed, breakfast, the market, meeting the twins, at dinner. My mission this morning was to get to the gate, to the entrance or preferably the exit. It was there in the back of my mind the whole time and still I didn't move close to the gate even once. As if I had forgotten, but how could I forget the most logical thing to do? There is no way that I would have just forgotten about that. The sanctuary didn't want me to take action. It doesn't want me to leave and so it makes me forget. With a little help from the neighbors. I would like to thank the long-time returning sponsor, HelloFresh. As you may know, HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit. When you sign up, you get pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your door. Now you can skip the trip to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy. Do you have a packed schedule this summer? Well, HelloFresh has you covered with a weekly selection of over 30 recipes and 70 plus convenience items all delivered right to you. And the convenience factor isn't only the great part. In fact, HelloFresh is 25% less expensive than takeout, and even cheaper than grocery shopping too. I've always been a huge fan of the massive variety that HelloFresh provides. Browsing their mouth-watering meals is honestly a ton of fun. Earlier this week, I had a bit of a sweet tooth, so I whipped up a tangy key lime pie. Perfect for summer and yes, it was as amazing as it sounds. Also, Green Chef is now owned by HelloFresh and with a wider array of meal plans to choose from, there's something for everyone. To get started, go to HelloFresh.com slash MrCreeps50 and use code MrCreeps50 for 50% off plus free shipping. Again, that's HelloFresh.com slash MrCreeps50. Use code MrCreeps50 for 50% off, plus free shipping. A big thanks to our sponsor, Morgan and Morgan. Recently, a close friend of mine was involved in a serious car accident. It was a devastating experience that left them with injuries and mounting medical bills. But what surprised me even more was the struggle to get the compensation that he deserved. That's when I realized the importance of having the right legal support. Morgan & Morgan is America's largest injury law firm, has over 100 offices nationwide, and a team of more than 800 lawyers ready to fight for you. With over $15 billion recovered for their clients, 
They have a proven track record of securing full and fair compensation. But what truly sets Morgan and Morgan apart is how easy they make the entire process. It's not like the traditional image of hiring a lawyer. It's as simple as using an app or ordering takeout. With only a few clicks, you can submit your injury claim from the comfort of your couch. No more hassle, no more stress. And remember, if you ever find yourself injured or in need of legal support, check out Morgan & Morgan. Their fee is free unless they win, ensuring that you can access the justice that you deserve without any upfront costs. For more information, visit ForThePeople.com slash MrCreeps or dial pound law, that's pound 529 from your cell phone. Again, that's for the people.com slash Mr. Creeps or pound law, pound 529 from your cell. This is a paid advertisement.